Good afternoon. So the title of this talk is Glacial Integration Changes of South American Hemisphere Zonal Circulation from the Geochemistry of South American and East Antarctic Dust. Uh, the data from this presentation were recently published in EPSL. The first author of, of this paper is uh, Stefania Gilli, uh, my former PhD student, and also it was in cooperation with people from uh, uh, USA, um, Brazilian, and Argentinian institutions. So the organization of this talk, first I will uh, talk a little bit about uh, a brief introduction, then I will um, explain a little bit how we sampled and um, characterized uh, dust sources and mother dust in South South America. Uh, then I will present a new uh, South South American dust provenance model, and I will compare this model with uh, Australian data, as well as uh, with, uh, I will uh, um, uh, compare the model with uh, outstanding paleo archives of the Southern Hemisphere, and finally some conclusions. So, as an introdu introduction, we can say that uh, the reconstruction of the position and strength of the southern westerly width has particular importance given its interaction with the Southern Ocean, its major driver of regional and global climate. Then, for understanding past atmospheric circulation and paleo environmental conditions in the Southern Hemisphere associated with continental dust sources, it is important to improve dust provenance model. In this sense, uh, among the continent of the Southern Hemisphere, South South America, uh, it is uh, of particular interest for paleoclimate study as it is the only landmass that intersect, oh, sorry, that intersect, uh, that intersect, intersecting both the zonal uh, circulation of both the southwesterly wind and the south tropical jet stream. Both uh, well, uh, wind systems interact with the arid area of South South America, uh, promoting uh, uh, wind erosion and uh, ensuring that uh, material deflected from this area are transported to the um, uh, southern hemisphere uh, environment. Um, according to Prospero, uh, et al., they, um, they uh, describe five different uh, main potential source areas in South, South America. The one is the Southern Altiplano, the other one is uh, the Puna region, uh, split it in two areas, uh, northern and southern Puna, the central west Argentina, northern, central, and south also, right here. Uh, another important uh, area is Patagonia and also Tierra del Fuego. An important third uh, atmospheric circulation at the world I want to highlight here is this one, associated with uh, uh, kind of uh, Andean foreign winds, locally called Sonda winds, that affect mainly this part of South South America. So, uh, based on um, um, uh, field evidence like this picture showing that activity in many, many the different places of the arid diagonal of South South America, uh, also based on um, satellite images showing dust storm in all these places, uh, along with uh, the uh, outstanding paper, sorry, along with the standard, uh, outstanding paper from Pro Prospero, all these evidences help us to um, fa or facilitate the sampling of top soil samples from uh, the potential source areas of uh, South and South America. Then we collected um, uh, topsoil samples from uh, enclosed basins, ray lakes, and uh, fluvial alluvial fans in order to be characterized in terms of grain size, distribution, mineralogical composition, chemical isotopic composition in different grain sizes. Uh, important uh, conclusion when from uh, some important conclusion about topsoil samples indicate that 
First, uh, the, top, the topsoil sample composition are similar to the composition of the locally outcropping rocks in each area. Um, uh, also important is that any differences in, in the rare elements and the isotopic composition uh, data between the fine and the coarse grain size of sediment are small compared to the overall variability that exists between the different regions. And then we conclude that the chemical isotopic composition signature for the different potential source areas of South, South America can be used with confidence in dust provenance study. So um, we propose a new uh, South, South America dust provenance model for the region. Uh, this mold, uh, model, uh, sorry, this model um, uh, was characterized in terms of rare element lead strontium and neodymium isotopes. For the purpose of this uh, talk, I will focus in strontium and neodymium data. Uh, strontium and neodymium data indicate when, the, when um, tops, uh, the isotopic composition of topsoil samples from South South America are plotted in terms of, the, of these both isotopes, they indicate that uh, the different uh, potential source area can be differentiated quite well each other. Along with uh, topsoil samples, we also collected uh, dust, mother dust, uh, a different locality indicated by the open yellow square here. Um, when we plot uh, the isotopic composition of uh, mother dust, for example, the isotopic composition of mother dust from uh, Patagonia indicated here, they are well constrained by the topsoil samples. Uh, for the case of uh, um, that sample collected in the in the in the other in this other uh, monitor station, they indicate they, they have a mixed composition between the southern Altiplano and the North Puna. But in particular, I want to focus in two stations uh, in the in the Pampa. This one in the southern Pampa called uh, at Bahia Blanca City, and here at the central Pampa in Marco Juare. The Bahia Blanca uh, monitoring station indicate that sometime this station received the uh, uh, Patagonia-like uh, signature, but that sometime it received um, a southern central west uh, Argentina signature. For the case of the uh, Marco Juarez station, uh, this uh, is a particular station because the isotopic composition in this station are quite heterogeneous as you can see here, and uh, data that dust are collected at this station indicate that it is a mix of material coming from the South Central West area and also uh, from the Southern Altiplano. Then we can uh, use this uh, provenance model to the interpretation uh, of uh, the paleo archive of the Southern Hemisphere. We are starting working in Pampian list, but Today I will show some data from the Southern Ocean, core sediment, and also from uh, East Antarctic dust record. When we plot the uh, isotopic composition of sediment cores of the Atlantic sector of the Southern Ocean, all these uh, cores right here, you can see that all these data fit uh, very well within our model. In particular, it's interesting to see that um, uh, uh, an important group of samples uh, fall in a mixing line between the South Central West and the Southern Altiplano, similar to uh, data collected here in the Central Pampas. And uh, uh, there, there are also uh, an important group of samples that fall in a mixing line between the Southern Altiplano and the Northern Puna. For the, for the uh, isotopic composition, uh, to, to evaluate the uh, provenance of dust from the ADC and Boston ice core, first we should say that uh, there are consensus that um, South South America is the major contributor of dust, uh, but still some contribution from Australia uh, is not discussed, as it's indicated in this uh, figure right here, where you can see that both uh, potential source area are somehow overlapped. However, when you um, 
C, uh, the isotopic composition of that sample collected in the, uh, at the southeast part of um, uh, the coast of Australia, right here, you can see that the, the isotopic composition of mother dust here after a severe dust storm show that they, they, they have a mixed composition which is uh, represented uh, in our mother uh, here. And that is the strontium and neodymium data uh, we collected here are uh, in agreement with new evidence based on lead isotopes, uh, which are again a significant glacial and Australian dust uh, contribution to Antarctica, and also uh, this is supported by model simulations. Then, uh, when we plot uh, the glacial dead data from, from Antarctica, we can see that most of the glacial dead data from Antarctica uh, uh, fall in uh, the isotopic composition of the South Central West area. A few of, of these samples have a typical uh, Patagonian composition and, few, and a few others have a Southern Puna composition. Uh, then we interpreted this data as the, the increased deflation over this area, probably powered by the Sonda winds. And uh, these data are uh, in agreement with several lines of geomorphological evidence and uh, atmospheric simulation that support an important role of this area during the, the Lake uh, Quaternary. Uh, finally, when, when we plot the interglacial data over our model, we can see that here the green dots indicate that the interglacial dust from East Antarctica fall, fall in a mixed line between the South Central West area and the Southern uh, Puna, the, the Southern Altiplano, and that um, uh, these data are in agreement with, are consistent with paleo data indicating dry condition in the Altiplano during the Holocene and all their interglacial, and also they are well, uh, they, they agree with data from the Bernard Island that uh, show that sometime the Bernard Island received the Southern Altiplano signature and, some, and also are in agreement with the, the data, the dust uh, composition from the Illimani Glacier. So, as a conclusion, uh, we can say that um, uh, for glacial period, paleo data indicate uh, a, a substantial decrease of the core of the southern western wind over the southern tip of South South America, and a strength of the northern margin of this wind system between 30 and 40 degrees here. Um, this probably uh, increased the deflation over the south central west area. Um, probably this power uh, uh, was powered by an overall strengthening of the sonar wind, sonar wind, sonar wind excuse me. And in a similar way, we can interpret the uh, subtropical jet stream that is during a glacial time, a time there was a, an, an equator world uh, movement of the subtropical jet stream that could increase the deflation over the Southern Puna and Northern Puna, uh, but weakened that emission from, this, from the Southern Altiplano. Probably uh, it is uh, explained by uh, high lake level lakes during that time. Thank you. Hello, uh, thank you everybody for still being here on the last afternoon of the um, conference. So today I'm talking about um, spatial re pressure reconstructions across Antarctica back to 1905 for um, summer. In the, the program it says seasonal, but we've decided to focus in on summer. Um, so you may be wondering um, what on earth a reconstruction of something going back just to 1905 is doing in a paleoclimate session. Um, it's not just that I've got quite a short attention span. Um, it's actually that this is actually quite a long extension to the observational record um, over the Antarctic. So the network of Antarctic research stations, as many of you will know, were first established in the International Geophysical Year of 1957-58. Um, and those stations are shown here on the, on the plot on the right. Um, 
Um, and as you can see, um, so there's um, regular meteorological measurements take, made at these stations since 1957-58. A few of the stations go back a few years earlier. Um, but you can also see that there's um, large gaps between stations that until the advent of uh, satellite observations and reanalysis uh, data um, can't really be filled. There's sort of some automatic weather stations and things like that. Um, there are two reanalysis products that exist, historical reanalyses, that go back um, at least to the beginning of the 20th century, so the 20th century reanalysis, an era 20th century. But as there are few high latitude data around in the early 20th century, there's a few from expeditions and ships passages, there's little data to constrain them. So I'm not saying that these reanalyses aren't valuable products, they're valuable product, products for the right geographical region and the right time period and the Antarctic and high southern latitudes at the beginning of the 20th century is the wrong region and the wrong time period to really get too much information out of these reanalyses at the moment. There are strong efforts to gather more historical data which help, should help constrain them. So that's the background to why we're going back to 1905. We'll increase the length of the record um, by a, just over 50 years. So we've undertaken a two-step process. So firstly, oh, what I should say, and I apologies, go back to the beginning. This is work led by Ryan Folks at Ohio University um, on an NSF project in which I'm a collaborator and lots of the footwork has been done by Chad Gergens, one of his ma uh, master's students. So I should make that clear at the beginning. Anyway, so back to where I was. So it's a two-step process. Firstly, we reconstruct station pressure at these um, 18 meteorological stations using teleconnections between high and mid-latitude pressure in the southern hemisphere. So I'll talk about that in the first bit of the talk. We did do that for the four seasons, so that has been done seasonally. And then in the next part of the talk, I'll talk about how we take advantage of the quite strong spatial homogeneity in pressure to perform spatial interpolation of these station reconstructions for domain 60 to 90 south back to 1905. We have also um, looked at the causes of the reconstructed pressure changes using climate model simulations. Um, I won't have, probably won't have time to talk about that today, but that's something that Dave Schneider did as part of this product, project. So in, sometimes in the talk, I'll be looking at um, geographically averaged pressure va variations. So here it just shows we divide the data into East Antarctica, West Antarctica, and the Antarctic Peninsula and also marked on here um, with the um, purpley colored dots are some automatic weather station data we use for evaluation. I should also point out that highly useful is Orcadas station, which has observed pressure going back to 1905. Um, so firstly, thinking about the station-based pressure reconstructions, uh, these came out last year in, in two papers again led by Ryan. So we basically used principal component regression between mid-latitude station sea level pressure and also Orcada sea level pressure as predictors to predict station sea level pressure from the reader network. Well, it was sea level pressure for the stations around the edge of the continent and then because sea level pressure doesn't mean that much over the Antarctic interior, we reconstructed surface pressure for Amundsen Scott and Vostok. So, so basically, for example, taking the example of Rothera Station would correlate the pressure at Rothera Station in each season with pressure at these mid-latitude stations. Those stations that were significantly correlated were then entered into principal component regression to reconstruct the station pressure back to the beginning of the century. Um, this was done for four seasons. Summer had the best validation statistics, so it was chosen for the spatial reconstructions. Um, the lowest spring, the, low, the skill was lowest in spring and autumn, and winter was kind of in between, so better than spring and autumn, not quite as good as summer. So just to give you an example of the, the reconstruction quality for the station-based pressure reconstructions in, in summer here, what you can see here is black is the um, observed pressure, and then uh, the red curve is um, the, the reconstructed pressure. Um, with the grey lines, the 95% confidence intervals of the reconstructions. Um, we use the leave one out cross-validation procedure. So you can see the calibration correlations are shown here for Halley and here for Murney. You can see the calibration correlations are really good, as are the validation correlations from the leave one out cross-validation 
um, and the reduction of error and coefficient of error. So these are pretty good reconstruction statistics where you can see they are lower for, for Murney than for Halley. Um, we found that the reconstruction skill was best near the Antarctic Peninsula, which is perhaps not surprising because of the uh, proximity of Orcardus to the stations being reconstructed. And the lowest in East Antarctica, but as I said, still pretty good in, in summer. So now um, what we've done is taken these um, station pressure reconstructions and undertaken a these are these pressure re station pressure reconstructions and undertaken a, a spatial reconstruction. We used Krieging to do this. Um, so the, the observed station pressure and Orcada's pressure were in, in, used as predict, uh, were interpolated. Um, we calculated firstly seasonal mean pressure anomalies relative to the 1981 to 2010 mean because we had sea level pressure at the coastal stations and surface pressure with the inland stations, we converted to pressure an anomalies, so we're reconstructing pressure anomaly fields. And this was done on an 80 kilometer by 80 kilometer Cartesian grid, um, centered over the South Pole, um, extending to 60 degrees south. And we defined the Krieging weights using era interim reanalysis during the calibration period of 1979 to 2013. Um, along with the station pressure from the 19 stations. So basically you kind of get the spatial, for each grid point, you get the spatial footprint by getting the covariance of that grid point with the era interim grid points closest to where the station, the reconstructed station data is. And then the Krieging weights for each point are based on that and also optimized to avoid model overfitting um, using a method of Nicholas and Bromwich because obviously the, the station pressures aren't independent to each other. So there's some optimization went on. And then we use these weights in connection with the anomalies from the individual station pressure reconstructions um, to produce the, the spatial pressure reconstructions. So what's the skill like? That's the first question. So the, the plot on the left, the plots on the left show the, the reconstruction correlation, correlation between era interim pressure anomalies over the period 1979 to 2013, which was the calibration period, and uh, the validation correlation. So to do the validation correlation, we did two sets of Krieging. So we determined the Krieging weights on the first half of the um, data set and then um, held aside the second part for validation and then defined, determined the Krieging weights on the second part and held apart the first part and then joined these together to get the validation reconstruction. And then we did the, the final reconstruction using Krieging weights defined over the entire period. So we're comparing them to era interim and also automatic weather station observations, which are independent because they didn't go into our reconstruction. And you can see that all skill measures are for, with the era in, when compared to the era interim are above 0.7 across the entire continent, uh, slightly lower skill over certain parts of East Antarctica where the, the station reconstructions had less skill, but still, you know, around about 0.6. Um, slightly lower agreement in some places with the AWS data, um, which we're going to look into. But you can see for, for reconstruction, um, pretty good reconstruction skill. So now what do the reconstructions look like? So these are pressure anomalies um, regionally averaged for those domains that I t showed you at the beginning of the talk. So, um, and the, the thick black line is our reconstruction with the 95% confidence intervals around it. The blue line is the era interim data, and then um, the 20th century reanalysis and the era 20th century uh, data in orange and red, respectively. So looking first at the um, comparison of bet between our reconstruction and the, and the reanalyses, um, an obvious thing that jumps out is the difference in the mean between the two reanalyses and our reconstruction at the beginning of the 20th century. Um, and there are very little data going into the reanalyses um, during this time period and at these latitudes to constrain the reanalysis. I think there is a little more data in the um, 20th century reanalysis, which may explain the better agreement, but it's obviously they've got different data assimilation methodologies, which in regions with sparse data, they will deal with the missing data in different ways. Um, so what's interesting is in the, the latter part of the reconstruction, so these show correlations um, between our reconstructions and the reanalyses um, there between 1979 and 2013. So we get better agreement with the um, era 20th century at the end of our reconstructions. And um, 
but better agreement with the 20th century reanalysis at the beginning. So what do these reconstructions show? Well, you can see no surprise, strong and statistically significant uh, negative pressure trends since 1960, um, fitting with the trend to the positive southern annular mode, a period of um, higher pressures in the mid 20th century. Um, and interestingly, so the Antarctic didn't experience pressure anomalies below five hectopascals um, and below, um, below minus five hectopascals until the late 20th and early 21st century. So looking at the spatial pressure differences, so this shows the pressure differences between the final 30 years of the reconstruction and the first 30 years, and then the final 30 years and mid 30 years. Stippling indicates a significant difference. So the, the main areas of significant lower pressure, in, so there's obviously pressures lower in the reconstructions in the final 30 years over most of the Antarctic. Um, these are significant over East Antarctic going into the Ross Sea um, for the beginning of the 20th century, and then for the mid 20th century, Unsurprisingly, because we had these positive pressure anomalies, the differences are significant over most of the Antarctic. So this is a first look at the sort of spatial pressure variability. Um, thinking about trends, um, these show trends in average pressure for all possible trend lengths over 30 years. So for example, the trend length here is a trend between the start year of 1905 and an end year of 2004 start year of 1965, end year of 2004. So you can see positive trends in the early 20th century too, up until trends ending in about 1990, which are significant, particularly over West Antarctica, but these trends aren't as strong as the negative trends um, at the end of the century. And these negative trends are strongest over the East Antarctic and West Antarctic, um, um, and they're the only statistically significant negative trends in the, in, in the uh, reconstruction. So to conclude, we present the first statistical spatial pressure reconstruction that's focused specifically on the Antarctic. So there are products out there like HADSI Level Pressure 2 and the reanalyses of the global, but this is the first one focused on the Antarctic, enabling for the first time looking at pressure variability and change across the entire Antarctic. We're, um, you know, these are first results we're writing up for publication. And although this only goes back to 1905, obviously this, this product will be something that hopefully people with proxy records over the Antarctic or in the sort of sub-Antarctic regions could use to help um, look at what's going on in their records. So um, less good agreement with the analysis in the early 20th century and the recent trends in summer during the last 30 years are unique when compared to the 20th century across Antarctica and these trends are most marked in East Antarctica extending through to the Ross Ice Shelf region. Um, so, um, I was going to say, we're right, um, Ryan's writing this up, well, we're writing this up, so um, any feedback is gratefully received during that process. So, thank you very much. So, first, I'd like to uh, acknowledge my co-author from uh, Lehigh University uh, in Hawaii and Texas. So uh, uh, I'm going to, uh, you know, there are broad scale emerging pattern around the Antarctic Peninsula and uh, South Georgia and the Patagonia and they relate to the climate pattern of the last 2000 years. And in particular, for example, between 2000 years ago and 1000 years ago, uh, there's some indication uh, enhanced westerly wind from uh, Falkland uh, Island and also there are uh, Heat record from South Georgia and Elephant Island uh, indicate uh, cooling conditions in uh, 2000 years ago. And also uh, from James Ross Island, the ice core show cooling trend from 2000 year. And uh, on the other hand, from uh, the uh, West uh, Antarctic Peninsula in uh, um, so Palmer Deep, uh, sea surface temperature reconstruction show a warming trend from 2000 years ago to 1000 years ago. And our recent work uh, on peat record from uh, near the Palmer uh, Deep region showed a similar pattern. And we tried to figure out, you know, uh, to uh, come up with some idea and the speculation what could happen, I, I blend those uh, uh, special pattern. And this is a close look of two records from uh, um, so Palmer Deep, the top one, and over the last 3,000 years. And you can see, um, so there, there are some 
some difference, uh, and the one is uh, I highlight the two interval from 2,000 years ago to 1,000 years ago from uh, uh, Palmer Deep uh, sea surface temperature show increase, and uh, on the uh, from uh, the James Ross Island on the east of Antarctic Peninsula, so decreasing trend, and also I highlight. Uh, around 500 years ago, so a slight warming on the Western Antarctic Peninsula, but cooling the coldest interval from uh, uh, East Antarctic Peninsula. So, uh, uh, so this is different. Uh, uh, another different is uh, the uh, magnitude is quite different from uh, Western Antarctic Peninsula. We look at, you know, the change up to eight degrees C, uh, but on the East, uh, 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 East Antarctic Peninsula, we talk about about two, two degree temperature changes. So the pattern different and uh, the uh, magnitude of the different. So now um, I'll show you some uh, a new result from our PEAT record. And uh, so this is map show our study site and uh, um, around the Palmer Station 65 degree uh, latitude. And uh, uh, so the study site for three different type of uh, information. So that mass tell us uh, uh, the, uh, um, the age of uh, peat bank plant was killed by ice advance, so we call it the kill age, and tell you the timing of uh, uh, ice advance, and from, uh, mostly from two islands, uh, uh, and uh, basal peat age tell us the initiation of peat, oftentimes under favorable condition and warm condition. And another the triangle show the uh, one short call and uh, 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 f well, I'll show you some of the results. Uh, and this also shows the uh, Palmer Deep uh, location, you know, only uh, uh, 30 kilometers from our study site and another bay further south, uh, and uh, which indicate that, you know, during the cold interval, you know, about seven, 800 years ago, you know, the ice shelf extended 30, uh, 90, 30 kilometers uh, further into the ocean. All right, so this is some summary the, uh, the result uh, um, I sh show you. Okay, so the top panel show the, uh, uh, the dead mass age and the indicate you know, individual age with uncertainty and also histogram indicate from 900 years ago to 600 years ago and a lot of uh, the uh, mass was killed at the retreating, uh, the, uh, retreating ice you know, due to a recent decade warming, but uh, the age tell us the last time the plant uh, uh, photosynthesis when the glacier, you know, uh, cover, uh, cover it uh, when the glacier advances. So this is a cold interval, and that's uh, also indicated by the lack of a basal age, and uh, uh, corresponds with the other record as well. And uh, so around 500 years ago, so um, our in evidence indicates that there are quite a lot of peat uh, in this area initiate around that time, so indicate warming. And that record has quite similar to uh, from uh, Palmer Deep Sea Surface Temperature, in a warmer, slight cooling, and the warm interval from around 2,000 years ago to 1,000 years ago. I'm going to show you some, uh, you know, record uh, from a peat core and uh, indicate, uh, you know, similar uh, pattern around that interval. So this is the short peat core, and uh, so the first one map show the uh, image show the location uh, the on the uh, Cap Rasmussen and on the mainland Antarctic Peninsula. And I'd like to point out that this is about 200 meters from the ice margin today. And the reason our interpretation, you know, about 1,000 years ago, actually our site was covered by the glacier. So the glacier covered over the entire area. And this photo showed the, uh, you know, this small feature of a study pit bank we call Core 2. And this is looking north of the ice margin, about 200 meters from the site. And this is a core, 35 centimeter long, and you can see from the core photo, the three section, kind of dark brown and blackened, and the fresh looking, you know, moss and this growth surface. So this is the uh, show, the summary result, right? So 35 centimeter, and we ha have a whole bunch of date. And uh, so three section, and the lower section from about 2300 year to 1200 year and dominated by uh, uh, death champsia, so Antarctic hair grass, so one of the two uh, vascular plants in the uh, um, Antarctic continent. And this is almost a pure stand, so we got, uh, you know, nothing else, and uh, so almost 90% of uh, microphoto assemblage with uh, um, a little bit of, you know, mineral material, 
and uh, with the minimal sand with, with abundant uh, you know, grass pollen during that interval. And the second interval, we kind of disturb. We call it the disrupt interval with the low organic matter as low as 40%. And uh, the mineral green content, the sand gravel, and up to 40%. So this interval, we uh, interpret the site was covered by glacier. And then, uh, uh, so about uh, 50, 60 years ago, we have three post bomb dating indicate the moss, the typical Antarctic, uh, you know, peat bank moss, the Polytrichum uh, occupy, recolonize the, uh, uh, the re exposed uh, peat surface, and so on. So we focus on that interval, the lower interval. And uh, so from 2000 to 1000 years ago, and we interpret that to represent a new novel ecosystem type, uh, so a uh, peat bog, uh, so Antarctic uh, hair grass uh, peat bog, uh, and so that kind of ecosystem, uh, you know, how evident from microfossil and from fruit and uh, grass pollen, and that kind of micro ecosystem uh, not exists anywhere in Antarctic today. And uh, the nearest location in the South Georgia and about 10 degree uh, further north and about two kilometers uh, away, and uh, so the temperature about 60 degree warming. And use that simple analogy, which indicates uh, so about 2000 to 1000 years ago, Antarctic Peninsula was about two degree warmer, and as a result, they can support the kind of warm climate, uh, you know, ecosystem. So this is e interpretation. And now I show you the new result, quite similar to a Palmer deeper sea surface temperature. And then the question is, so what caused that change? So, uh, and especially the difference between uh, East Antarctic Peninsula and West Antarctic Pen Peninsula. So we focus on that two interval. And there's some claim, you know, from 2000 years ago, 1000 years ago, so the westerly wind intensify. And so maybe uh, the observed pattern has something to do with that. And uh, so this is the animation show the regional scale simulation of uh, the uh, upper circumpolar deep water kind of penetration onto the, uh, um, an, you know, shelf, Antarctic uh, coast, West Coast shelf, and as a response to increasing uh, wind strength. So this circle indicates our study site at the Alexander Island. And uh, you see the warm water, we know the uh, circumpolar deep water with a couple of degrees warmer than the surface water. So the deep water CDW come from uh, low latitude ocean. And if you could come to the surface, uh, and that would uh, cause uh, warming. But not everywhere, you see there, there are channels, so what they call canyon, you know, the end water topography play a major role to allow, to facilitate the warm water penetration. So this warmer, and if we go back to the same area for so work, and we would use that kind of evidence, so where to go to find the potential, you know, uh, vegetation, and the people use that to uh, explain the penguin colony as well. So just summarize, so this is idea speculation about 2,000, 1,000 years ago. So you have a stronger westerly with a positive or same southern annual mode, and uh, on the west. Antarctic Peninsula, you have, uh, uh, you know, enhanced warm CDW penetration, and as we just reduce the sea ice cover and, uh, uh, you know, large magnitude of the coastal warming, right? Um, and on East Antarctic Peninsula and South Georgia, so maybe a positive of SAM induced southward uh, movement, expansion of warm air, and you have increased precipitation and ice melt as a result of lower surface water salinity and stable stratification. Uh, as a result, you have less deep water convection to the surface and reduce uh, the heat transport from water to the air and cause cooling. And uh, so what people call, you know, Iceberg Alley may play a role to transport that signal for the north to the South Georgia. And that uh, the, uh, you know, Antarctic Peninsula, Wendell Sea, and uh, so this uh, Iceberg Alley, you know, most Iceberg actually not only from uh, the uh, Antarctic Peninsula area, but from the entire continent. Uh, so come follow the coastal current uh, and come up here, so potentially play a role to transfer the, uh, uh, the signal. Okay, for the 500-year uh, uh, event, uh, and uh, so we have some information. So this is the uh, SAM reconstruction for the last thousand years, and around that time is the, uh, the most negative, you know, SAM uh, uh, phase. And also globally, you know, we have ideas of La Nina-like condition and the global temperature, or at least not the hemisphere temperature lower. And uh, so uh, how that would explain that? You know, there are a lot of discussion about, you know, tropical and uh, polar Antarctic connection. 
So uh, we did a kind of real nice analysis for the sea surface, sea level pressure, and consider the recent uh, uh, La Nina event during the recent year and uh, to make the um, anomaly map, right? So I like to highlight uh, the elution when you have uh, you know, tropical Pacific has a La Nina condition, you know, the uh, elution, uh, sorry, amount of sea low become deeper and as a result, you have that clockwise, uh, you know, wind direction. And for the Western Antarctic Peninsula, may get uh, more warm air, northerly warm air, and you warm this section. And uh, so uh, not much happening in the uh, east side. Actually, you know, there are some uh, suggestions by Turner, you know. So you have a stronger SAM westerly, and as a result, uh, you get uh, warmer on the east side of the Antarctic Peninsula because of that uh, crossing Antarctic Peninsula, a foreign wind and a warm wind. So when you have a weaker east, uh, westerly, and that effect will be uh, reduced, so on. All right, just to summarize, so, uh, you know, a possible, you know, enhanced westerly around 2,000, 1,000 years ago may induce a large warming on the Western Antarctic Peninsula because of the, uh, um, the warmer circumpolar deep water for the penetration to the coast area. And uh, on the East Antarctic Peninsula and the South Georgia may be due to, uh, you know, uh, the uh, uh, deep water convection and uh, reduce the heat transport from uh, deep water to the atmosphere. And the uh, iceberg alley may play a role as well. So for the, uh, um, about 500 years ago, you know, the opposite pattern may indicate uh, so different response uh, or tropical connection to the amount of sea low and then uh, as a result, uh, so very small regional, you know, uh, difference. So the idea is that the original climate uh, precipitation temperature in the Antarctic region, you know, responds to global, like tropical ocean condition and hemisphere scale, you know, SAM uh, may be dependent on regional and the local setting. So they're strong, not only global, but also the regional and uh, local strong feedback from, uh, you know, atmosphere, ocean, and ice, the sea ice, the sh ice shelf, uh, and ice sheet, uh, so on. Uh, and make, uh, you know, the reason people, you know, re recently you talk about, uh, you know, in this region, there are larger uh, natural climate variability, and because of that strong local, regional, and global feedback effect. Uh, thank you very much. Okay, good afternoon. Um, Back to the westerlies now. Uh, we've got a project that's been st studying the uh, southern hemisphere westerly winds in the core belt uh, over the, in the, in the uh, southern ocean uh, by looking at records from sub-Antarctic islands. And this is a collaboration between a number of labs, uh, a, British Ant a group of people at the British Antarctic Survey who I work with, Christina Saunders at Anstow in Australia, a Belgian lab uh, at Ghent, U Ghent University, and Martin Grosjean's lab at the University of Bern. So, southern hemisphere westerly winds, if you haven't already had it bashed into you this afternoon, are uh, the strongest time average oceanic winds on the planet. Uh, they circle around the Antarctic continent, uh, and in their core belt, their average speed is around about 10 meters per second. So, they dominate uh, most features of the southern hemisphere. I'm just going to talk about some of this. This is a pages meeting, so we need to look at the relevance of what we do uh, to humans. And the next few slides are going to show how the southern hemisphere westerly winds are of critical importance and why a lot of people here today are focusing on trying to understand their history. So first of all, they determine moisture availability in the southern hemisphere continents and therefore the success or failure of agriculture. They drive warm circumpolar deep water, so circumpolar deep water, up onto the continental shelf. I was very envious of Zick's animation there. It beautifully showed how when you've got enhanced westerlies, you drive warm water onto the continental shelf. Now what that does is that erodes ice sheets from below. A decade ago, people were talking about ice sheets being eroded by surface air temperature, but the pendulum has switched now to uh, many studies actually modeling and observing the deterioration or melting of ice sheets from below. And this is particularly important for the West Antarctic ice sheet. There's been a number of papers recently that have modeled how 
once warm circumpolar deep water gets into the ocean, ocean cavity beneath the ice sheet, uh, particularly in the Thwaites Basin, uh, that you can have a rapid uh, ice sheet retreat. And one of those models, of course, the most extreme model, shows a sort of 17 meters of sea level rise equivalent in 1,000 years. Now, I think that the modelers even uh, suggest that that's just theoretical, but we need to test that with our, our field data. But there's been a whole raft of papers talking about the uh, rapid effects of warm water getting in underneath the West Antarctic ice sheet. Why should we be concerned about that? Sea level rise, of course. The next service the Southern Ocean and the westerly winds perform for us are to act as a major carbon dioxide sink and a sink of ocean, uh, a sink of heat. So I'm going to focus on the carbon dioxide here. The Southern Ocean represents around about 43% of the global oceanic anthropogenic CO2 uptake. So that's performing a vital service to us. If that sink is performing well, it's slowing down the rate of carbon dioxide accumulation in the atmosphere, and if it's performing badly, that, that rate of CO2 will increase. And there's been a couple of models uh, in recent years, uh, one by uh, Corinne Lequerre, the red line here, which showed that the Southern Ocean carbon dioxide sink or uptake had flattened uh, over, uh, over the instrumental record um, while CO2 continued to go up. And then there was another record later using the same data showing that the sink had strengthened again. So whether this sink is in a positive or negative uh, overall phase is, is critically important. And to work that out, we need to look at um, uh, records beyond the instrumental period. So the final slide uh, on why Southern Hemisphere Westerlies, well, of course, they're involved in all the major climate variables that you see around the Southern Ocean. I'll just pick out a few of these. Uh, the SAM index that Nerily, Nerily Abraham and uh, Steve Marshall have talked about, sea surface temperature anomalies, sea ice extent anomalies, everything in the Southern Hemisphere is modulated by the Southern Hemisphere westerly winds. So what we wanted to do is actually look at the history of the winds over longer time scales because the instrumental record is really very short. What we have is uh, a number of good records from South America, and we've seen some of those uh, on the posters today, um, and, but what we're lacking is records for the westerly winds throughout its entire core belt with the exception of this area of southernmost South America. So the aim of our project has been to look at the changing strength of the westerly winds throughout their core belt uh, and to address a number of questions. And the two questions that we're going to address uh, in this talk is uh, how do the southern hemisphere westerly winds interact beyond, uh, beyond the instrumental record with things like temperature, sea surface temperature, uh, sea ice, etc. And we're going to give an example of that from Marion Island. So this is really taking some of the modern patterns we see in the instrumental record and seeing if they actually carry on back through the, the paleo record. And then the second example uh, is to look at the longer records and ask this question, are changes in past southern hemisphere westerly wind intensity, intensity sufficient to explain past changes in atmospheric carbon dioxide? So this is, our, this is the big question. Is that southern, southern ocean sink operating in a positive or negative phase uh, with respect to the winds? So we've developed a number of ways of tracking the winds. I think it's critically important that when we're talking about wind records, that we either have a number of sites that are showing uh, uh, the same pattern in the winds with a single proxy, or that at single sites we have multiple proxies that are showing the same uh, pattern in the winds. So we've tried to get independent proxies, of which we have focused on looking at wind-driven sea, sol sea, sea salt aerosol inputs into lakes and wind-driven minogenic aerosols. These are detected by different methods. The sea salt aerosol is by a diatom-based uh, transfer function that looks at the arrival of sea spray into west coast lakes. And the wind-driven uh, aerosols are measured by two independent methods, X-ray fluorescence and uh, specim hy hyperspectral, that which is an optical method. So let's just get this into context. We're focusing on lakes on the west coast of tiny islands in the sub-Antarctic. So there's no continental effects here. It's a gross uh, import of material both from the atmosphere and the ocean. What sort of, uh, what sort of magnitude of effect is that? Well, at Macquarie Island, for example, the, the daily wind run is 751 kilometers a day. So if you wake up in the morning and then 
wake up the next morning, you've 751 kilometers of atmosphere has passed over your head. Sometimes the wind gusts there go to 185 kilometers an hour. So this is not subtle amounts of sea spray wafting in as you'd see on the coast of uh, most parts of the world. This is a brutal effect and you can often see the sea spray being lifted straight out of the ocean and dumped onto the land. So we've gone for these sort of uh, areas where the effects of the winds have a gross impact on the coastal lakes and, and peat bogs. So uh, just a little bit about the diatom transfer function. So what that sea spray does is it causes sea spray to be, uh, to, to be uh, lifted from the ocean, you can see it here, and dumped onto the land. And as a result, there is a salinity gradient which goes west to east across all the sub-Antarctic islands. So lakes and bogs on the west are saline or have salty influences, and on the east are fresh. And you can see that in in both in direct measurements, but also this is reflected in the diatom species that live in those lakes and bogs. So if you look down in sediment cores and you trace th those diatom species and you apply a model that looks at observed um, conductivity versus reconstructed conductivity, so you get a model, and these typically have R squareds of between 0.7 and 0.8, you can then reconstruct past salinity changes down the core and compare them with your mineral, uh, your mineral aerosol inputs. So you've got two ways of doing it. Um, so I'm just going to give a, an example from Marion Island. Uh, this is lake, again, here, right on the west coast. Sea spray is coming straight in. Uh, what sort of pattern do we get uh, from that? I'm going to get stuck straight into results. It's late in the, late in the conference. No diatom diagrams. Um, this is the record from Marion Island. At the top here, you have the diatom conductivity, so the sea spray, in, the sea spray transfer function that tells you about how salty the lake is. This is it here. The next one is the diatom PCA uh, axis related to salinity. And then you have the uh, XRF sea salt aerosol record. So you, I hope you agree that those records are all correlated uh, and that the forcing is external and it's from the southern hemisphere westerly winds. You'll notice the sharp eye view and wake of you will notice there's two little spikes here uh, that don't correspond to anything in the diatom record. They're volcanic uh, tephra. So uh, we, we've uh, obviously factored that out. So what you can see here, uh, let's remember the instrumental record is a tiny piece up in, up in the right-hand corner. This extends our record of the westerly winds all the way back, in this case, to 1300. And I've put that, this is a pages meeting, against the pages Australia 2K reconstruction. And we can see a very nice uh, match between southern hemisphere temperature and southern hemisphere um, uh, Sorry, and southern hemisphere extreme events. So was that two minutes, Christina? Or did you hold up a thing? Yeah, two minutes, okay. So I'll, I'll move swiftly on. I'm happy to talk that through with anyone afterwards. So the next, uh, next uh, issue was, uh, next example was looking at this issue about CO2. Do we see a relationship between wind strength and carbon dioxide as measured in ice cores? Again, our three proxies are um, correlated with each other. These are the two mineralogenic aerosol proxies, and the uh, correlation between them is up at 0.83. The diatom salinity proxy also is positively correlated at uh, 0.59, slightly less correlated because diatoms respond to multiple environmental variables. In this case, the primary one is the salinity, um, but there are other influences. So what do we get out of that record? Um, this is the, the wind, uh, relative wind speed at Macquarie Island uh, from uh, around about 12,500 years ago to present, stacked up against um, the ice core record of temperature and carbon dioxide. I'll just focus on those two things uh, for the moment. So what you'll see from this record, just, just ignore all the small wriggle, wiggles, the gross signal in this record is one that says high winds, so here, correspond with an outgassing of CO2 from the ocean. And low winds correspond with a downturn and a net absorption back into the oceans. Uh, and then high winds from about 7,000 years onwards, persistent high winds across the Southern Ocean, uh, correspond with a resumption in the uh, uh, net uh, loss of carbon dioxide from the ocean. So that's the main message I want you to get from that uh, record around, around carbon dioxide. That supports the Togweiler hypothesis that says that the oceans were uh, outgassing of CO2 from the oceans uh, were responsible uh, for uh, temperature change across the 
uh, last glacial interglacial transition. Uh, and what implications it has for the future is that if, if high winds result in outgassing of carbon dioxide or a, a loss in the performance of the Southern Ocean sink, then the increase in the winds that has been measured in the instrumental record over the last 60 or 70 years uh, is telling us that we can expect if those winds continue to increase that the performance of the southern hemisphere, so sort of southern ocean carbon sink will, will decline and so the CO2 in the atmosphere uh, will uh, no longer be uh, moderated as much by the southern ocean. Thank you very much. I have a question regarding your index because um, I didn't get uh, what it means, this 815 to 900 in index. What does it mean and how is it related to the Westerlies? So this is a, an index that tracks mineralogenic aerosols in sediments. It's a, an optical method of detecting minerals in sediments. Um, the, the best thing to read is the pages news where uh, Martin Grosjean and his lab uh, did a, a piece on how the optical indexes work. So you can, you, typically they've been used to look at uh, pigments, chlorophylls and carotenoids, but also you can pick out the mineral component optically. So we wanted to look at different ways of detecting the mineral component so that we weren't relying on, uh, on a single method. Thank you very much. All of you that still are sitting in here in this beautiful Saturday afternoon. And, uh, I also would like to thank my co-authors on this uh, talk. Uh, and I'm going to take you to the, back to the Southern Ocean uh, and back to this uh, lovely, beautiful uh, subantarctic island, South Georgia. And I'm going to present for you a uh, full Holocene uh, glacier reconstruction from this island. And I guess after Dominic's introduction now and his talk, I don't think we need to, to um, use any time on telling everyone here why this area is important. Um, and especially the subantarctic islands are very important to understand uh, the terrestrial response of the changes we see in the southern ocean, both in the past, in the present, but also for future climate uh, evolution. And uh, South Georgia is uh, situated in the middle of, uh, of Action Center. Um, we have uh, the Drake Passage here and the uh, Antarctic uh, 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 current are going straight uh, across the Drake Passage here. And it's not many islands actually that are suited for this type of uh, reconstructions. For those of you who went to the poster session this morning, you might saw the poster that we had about a similar study on the Kaguerian Island, but it's not many records that are possible to produce. And later in my talk, I will uh, argue that uh, the, the southern hemisphere westerlies are very important to force actually the hemispheric signature of uh, glacial variability, uh, especially during the, uh, the late Holocene and during the near glacial. And I guess I don't need to say anything more about this very powerful wind system that are modulating the climate over this region. And also, it's worth noting that uh, the warming we have seen in the subantarctic region also can be attributed to the polar world movement of the southern hemisphere westerlies. Also seen as a positive, uh, uh, positive trend in the southern annual mode. So what's going on in South Georgia at the moment? There is a massive melting going on on glaciers. So this is one example from a, a tidewater glacier called the Nymaria Glacier. It has been retreating more than four kilometers uh, since the 70s. It's close to 100 meters a year. Uh, you can see the grounding line of the glacier out here where the white arrow is. That was also the position in the, in the 70s, but also the, close to the maximum position during the Little Ice Age. Uh, we have dated the moraine deposited here, and that's the Little Ice Age moraine and these icebergs are marking the grounding line uh, from the 70s. So there's a massive melting going on. Uh, the target for our study is not the tidewater glaciers, but more the smaller cirque glaciers that are responding very quickly to any climatic perturbation. And this is some photos that's, that has been taken by researchers uh, in the Rich Antarctic Survey, uh, showing a Hodges Glacier in 1955 and 1982. And you can clearly see how the glacier has retreated and also how it had thinned. And by the time we went there for our first survey in 2008, the entire glacier was melted away. So it's really a, a powerful thing that is happening in the cryosphere of South Georgia. And just summarizing this here, uh, both the Tidewater Glacier and the Neumar Glacier here, you see the length variations. And this is the record of the Hodgson uh, Glacier that was melted away in 2008. 
And then we also are very fortunate here because we have a 100 year long temperature record from the King Edward Point research station. And if you put the front position of the Hodges glacier on top of the uh, temperature record, you clearly can see the, uh, the connection between the rising temperatures and uh, the retreat of the glacier. So uh, we are, of course, not the first going down here and thinking that this is an important area to study glaciers. And a lot of earlier works have been here. Uh, and from the 60s and 70s, there was some information about like four different uh, time spent in rain formation. There's later been several expeditions down there studying the glaciers, refining the, the picture. And also the British Antarctic Survey has done a lot on the bathymetric survey of the fjords to constrain the glaciations during the Antarctic cold reversal. So to fill in this gap and to make continuously reconstructions, we have used another approach here. We have combined two different methods. We have uh, gone for the thermal moraines uh, and uh, dated uh, embedded boulders with uh, cosmogenic uh, nuclides. And we have used uh, that in combination with sediments retrieved from these two flat glacier lakes. So this is a, a very exciting approach. It takes some time though, but you need to spend some time in the glacier fall and you need to map out the uh, moraines. You need to sample them. You need to sample the catchment for, uh, for uh, glaciogenic material. And you need to, to make a survey of the lake. You need to do seismic investigations. And then you finally need to core the lake. And after that, a lot of funny things are going on in the lab when you come back home. But I hope I could convince you that all this effort was actually worth it because it, these two methods are very complementary and can give you a lot of valuable information. So I'm going to take you now back to South Georgia. The red dot is King Edward Point, where British Antarctic Survey have our research station. Uh, that has been the base for our two field expeditions down there. Uh, they have been very helpful in helping us out, carrying our stuff around in the, in the mountains there. So it's an excellent facility run by British Antarctic Survey for doing field studies. And I'm going to show you some results from these three squares you see here. But before, I just want to advertise for a paper that was recently published in Journal of Potential Science, where we did a high resolution study of the retreat from the uh, moraines in the middle Humber Lake. So that's something you can read about. It's a very nice record of the last 1200 years and how these glaciers have behaved. So that's filling in part of the picture, but the big picture, we need to go for the systems that have uh, a larger uh, moraine system. And here we are close to King Edward Point. The Hodges Glacier that was once sitting up here is now melted away. And you see the moraine system that once covered the lake. And you see several moraines deposited up valley. Uh, and, uh, in, and also some ages here. These moraines are deposited between eight and 10,000 years ago. These in the mid Holocene. And the upper one here is deposited during the near glacial and the Little Ice Age. And then we go back to the Neumar Glacier. Uh, we tried to date the history of the retreat of the Neumar Glacier when it retreated inland from after the Antarctic cold reversal. At one point, this glacier was also going in the Olsen Valley here. Uh, and uh, that retreat is uh, kind of consistent in, uh, with the retreat after the Antarctic cold reversal. And then we also worked on this uh, moraine system that was deposited by the, a small glacier situated uh, close to the Diamond Peak. We call it the Diamond Glacier. And this is also complemented by a lake study that was pre also presented in a process session today by uh, Lea Operal uh, to fill in the gaps between the, the moraines. So, it's, so we've done a lot of, of work down here. To summarize then the exposure ages, we can briefly say that we had a deglaciation here around 13,000. The ice was uh, ice, no, the glacier was ice, no, I'm sorry, the lake was ice free. And then we have the retreat from the lowermost moraine here around 8,000, slow retreat further up, up the valley. And then we had the onset of the Neo Glacier uh, just after 4,000 and some uh, major little ice age advance uh, as the innermost moraine. So to fill in this big picture, uh, we then used the lake, Lake Gull Lake. And now I'm standing at the point where uh, what the Hodges Glaciers once was sitting and looking down the catchment. And you see the, the Gull Lake here. Um, and this is uh, the raft that we used that was carried around in the landscape of uh, South Georgia. Uh, so first we did all the mapping of the lake and you can see it's a quite uh, simple lake system. At the po point when we was there, the lake level was lower because of a uh, uh, construction of a hydropower uh, uh, station for the research station here. 
Uh, but you can see the bathymetry here, and you can see the distribution of the soft sediments, and the yellow dots are the cores that we have used. Uh, in general, I can say that the soft sediments are evenly distributed uh, in the lake, uh, indicating that uh, most of the sediments are delivered in suspension in the finer fractions, like uh, silt and clay. And then we enabled the age depth uh, relationship uh, doing radiocarbon dating on uh, plant macrofossils. Uh, you see that there are, in some periods, some outliers, and they are all connected to periods when you have glacier advances and when you have more inwash of, uh, of organic material. Uh, but they are quite easy to, to see where that happens. So I think the age depth the relationship here is, uh, is fairly good. And then we did a catchment sample to try to connect then the glacial sediments deposited on land with what we actually could see in the lake. And we did uh, the same type of analysis on the sediments on land as is in the lake. We did uh, rock magnetic properties, grain size, key chemical elements, and so on. So basically what we see is that the sediments deposited in the lake have the same properties as what we see on land here in the final fraction. And also when we go towards the glaciers, you can see that the uh, sediments are enriched in titanium and magnesium. And then <coughs> during the... Um, uh, after all this multi-proxy approach, we do a PCA just to see if there is any, um, any, uh, any uh, how the relationship between the different proxies are. And you can clearly see that the uh, PCA axis one is the one that is controlling most of the variability in the, in the lake. So to sum this up, here you see the uh, uh, different uh, parameters. Upper here you see the, uh, the Diamond Glacier, all the Cosmo Ages. Here you see the Neymar Glacier. You see the Hodges Glacier here. And you can also see the uh, magnetic visibility from the uh, uh, Gull Lake here. And when this goes down, we have glacier advances. And when this goes up, this is inverted scale, and the glacier is smaller. And you can see that there's an overlap here between the time span when you have more information and when you have a massive input of uh, glaciogenic sediments to the lake. And you can also see then the stepwise retreat. The glacier is here in the mid Holocene, retreating slowly, still depositing in moraines, before we have the massive onset of the near glacier after 4,000. And you can also see here how nicely these two methods are complementary for each other, <coughs> because with only the cosmogenic uh, samples here, it would be really be hard to understand uh, what happened, for example, in the mid Holocene here. And it would also be very difficult to understand when a neoglacial started in this, uh, this catchment. So putting this into a broader context, and also to see how this is uh, operating on a southern Hampshire time scale, we can see here first uh, com uh, uh, combining this with a DOMAC magnetic suitability record from the Palma Deep here, uh, which is an indication of uh, glacial activity in West Antarctica. And you can see very much the same features. You have a, a retreat around 8,000, a stable mid Holocene, and the onset of the near glacial after 4,000. And this major picture here is deviating very much from what we see in the northern hemisphere, because there we have actually the largest glacial advance during the Holocene, very often in the, connected to the dead ice age. Uh, but here we actually have a continuous retreat at the position of moraines all the way up until the little ice age. And then if we look at this in a broader hemispheric uh, context, we can compare it with uh, Cosmo ages from uh, Southern Alps, New Zealand, from Patagonia. You see that there is a very coherent picture here, also moraine formation during the neoglacial. And comparing it then also to the temperature records that are available from the area. First, we can do the look at the Mulvaney record from James Ross ice cap. And this is the coffee from West Antarctica. You see that they are deviating a little bit in the early phase of the Holocene. Uh, where you have very warm temperatures in the record from Mulvaney at all, whereas the Kuffer record is showing a general warming until uh, mid, late mid Holocene. But they're both agreeing in the latest part of the Holocene and showing a cooling. So, uh, so this is kind of uh, uh, very, very uh, robust uh, and very coherent uh, looking at the hemispheric scale. And looking at the, then the, uh, the, the latest phase, the neoglacial here, uh, we can see that. Uh, we have this cooling trend, and going back to the title of my talk, providing pacing of the subantarctic glaciers, we can see that we have a long-term cooling trend, and superimposed on this cooling trend, we had a lot of centennial scale 
uh, glacial variability shown in these three records here, all from South Georgia. And that we are also claiming here that we can see a kind of a pattern when we look at the uh, Patagonia records, the New Zealand records, that there is a, a, a hemispheric imprint that we only can attribute to the southern hemisphere vestalis. So summary, summary of this, uh, we have presented here a continuously subantarctic glacial uh, reconstruction uh, all the way back to the Antarctic cold reversal. Uh, we have successfully dated uh, the onset of the neoglacial to after 4,000, and we are speculating that the southern hemisphere vestalis uh, are the primary driver of the subantarctic glaciers on the decadal to multi-decadal timescales. And uh, we're also saying that uh, the shifts in the westerlies are probably aligned with the temporary reorganization of the southern annual mode, where a positive polarity is generally in phase with glacial advances. So with a picture from the lovely penguins of South Georgia, I just say thank you all. Good day, everybody. This, um, this project is um, a, work, a study funded by the New Zealand Antarctic Research Institute. And we set out to um, figure out the early Holocene oceanic circulation in the Southwest Pacific. And we being that group of people with uh, Joe Preble, Ellen Bostock, and myself as PIs. And in case you wonder, the blue dude is Tangaroa, the Maori god of the ocean, throwing some eddies around. So these are, these are the stations, uh, the, the core sites that we got. And uh, there is a very simplified oceanographic, uh, modern oceanography shown in there with the main fronts, like the polar front, subantarctic, and the subtropical frontal zone in green. And, and this one is actually uh, the so-called Tasman front. So these are the two, the two main conduits of warm water in this direction are this one, coming off from the East Australian current, the Western Boundary current, and the subtropical frontal zone, because the East Australian current actually goes around Tasmania here, and then there is a retroflexion in the form of eddies going out this way, which creates a sort of diffused subtropical zone here, which becomes much more constrained in this area, and then it flows east, constrained by the Ch Chatham rise. This position and also this branch of the subantarctic water is also very important to this talk because it, currently there are uh, spin-offs of subantarctic water that come up in this region, and we will try to capture this sub signal with this, mainly with these two cores across the subtropical front. Uh, this is the uh, sea surface temperature distribu distribution in this area based on uh, Modis Aqua data. And there you will see the, uh, the, the temperature gradient. And you see that the big nick there is actually the, the subtropical front, basically on that side. And the, the impetus for this work was from this original work for, by Katarina Panke. She, wor she worked out Alcanon reconstruction temperature reconstructions at these two sites, so basically on the two, two opposite sides of the subtropical front. And she also, and she noticed that, for instance, in the, during this time slice, this would be the early Holocene time slice, and this would be a mid-Holocene time slice, if you want. And there was a reduced gradient of temperature across opposite sides of that front. And then the gradient was coming closer to present day, which would be roughly eight degrees, uh, already by roughly the mid-Holocene. So what we did was to extend on this approach. We, we chose a few other cores where we had good chronology and uh, good, good enough resolution, like we aimed for roughly 200 years be between samples. And we focused on this interval, 11.8 to 6 kilo years. At seven sites, we generated 550 temperature estimates. And uh, we have age controls like one, more than 100 carbon-14 data points and a few TEFRA ages. And what we did was actually to use quite a bunch of different proxies, magnesium, calcium, on two foreign species, alkanons, and temperature reconstructions based on three fossil groups, foraminifera, dinocysts, and radiolaria. Some of, some of these were published, some of these were developed during this project. What you will typically end up with is something like this, like this is for the last, we have 14,000 years. Uh, different different proxies and with their own errors and w the way we coped with that it was to uh, create Bayesian uh, age models uh, using as an error measure the radiocarbon dating error and then uh, we generated envelopes of error around each 
proxy point by using the modern calibration error and, and doing Monte Carlo modeling on that. That will lead to something like this, like you will have envelopes. This will be multiple proxies at one single site. So each of these will be one, one, one sigma variability, one sigma deviation from the proxy record for each of the proxies. And then eventually you want to summarize all of that together and you create a consensus estimate with the different proxies and you have one sigma and two sigma bands around, the, around your proxy data. These are all the data, of course, we don't go in detail. And, oh, and the data were binned in 500 years bins. So this will be two typical time slices and the way that these are summarized, this, this is temperature anomalies uh, compared to modern. No, actually temperatures, temperatures. And uh, this is latitude north of the subtropical front. And these are our sites. So the gray band there is the modern temperature gradient across the subtropical front. And this is what we find during the early Holocene. And this is what we find during, uh, and here the dark gray is uh, the temperature gradient uh, during mid Holocene, basically during this time slice. So what we, what we see is that the, there is a substantial deviation of temperatures during uh, roughly in this uh, latitude, latitudinal band by a few degrees uh, just across the subtropical front, which means it's, there is a much reduced uh, gradient as was observed initially by Katarina Panky in her work. And this difference attenuates and gets closer to today's situation already by roughly the mid Holocene. Additionally to reconstructing temperature, we actually used the different fossil groups that we had. We had census data for each of these in order to use them as multi-channel, if you want, uh, proxies for specific water masses. These are, this is based of course on modern data, on a modern data set. And we are able actually to assign uh, for for assemblages to let's say in orange here it's uh, subtropical water, subtropical frontal zone conditions uh, and uh, subantarctic water and so on for different fossil groups and then reconstruct them down core. How this changed through time just to gauge which water masses were prevalent at each of these positions. And the results are summarized here. Th this part is the same as you saw before. So it's the temperature information and the, the colored background is the modern one, the expected uh, patterns and the, the squares are the time slice information. This is for the early Holocene and this is for the middle Holocene. What, what we see is actually uh, the, this indication of diffusion of the subtropical front is also reflected in the, in the, prox in the water mass proxies because you see foraminifera tend to in a way invade across the subtropical front in areas where they are not, this assemblage is not really represented and doing the same southwards. And this gets a little bit closer to modern conditions in here. And it's a pattern that it's similar in all, across all microfossil groups. So our scenario is this one. We, we suggest that there is a, during the early Holocene, there is a, a weaker uh, westerlies driving the, mainly driving the ACC flow and essentially having a li limited a smaller uh, inflow of subantarctic water onto the Bounty Gyre during the early Holocene, which allows the subtropical frontal zone to expand southwards compared to recent, allowing also the faunas to go across it, and in general have a smaller temperature gradient across it. In order, to, oh, oh, and this is by the way very similar to what we find also in another time slice study uh, that we carried out for stage five. These are temperature anomalies between the maximum temperature we reconstructed, in this case based on forums, in, during a, a time window across stage five and mean modern. So basically the main signal that we observe even during stage five is on this side of New Zealand, on the, on the, in the Bounty Gyre area, compared to a relatively muted signal in the Tasman Sea and along the Tasman front. Um, then we wanted to test if this pattern was actually captured by some modeling approach and we used PICT, which is actually not strictly a model. A model. This is a so-called uh, yeah, paleo, paleo climate interpretation tool. And it, it, was it that, what it does, it's basically a sort of pattern ma matching using uh, uh, observation, meteorological observations, synoptic observation, and it uses NCAR reanalysis and extracts the main synoptic patterns based on empirical orthogonal function. 
And then what it does, it tries to match this pattern to the pattern pred or that, that is seen in the, in the paleo data, in the proxy data. And what we see here are maps of climate parameters, uh, synoptic type, type climate parameters, like change in geopotential height or change in temperature, for between mid Holocene minus early Holocene. So basically what this map shows is that you have in, uh, during the mid Holocene higher highs in South Australia, uh, which means com and, we and lower lows in, uh, in this region, which means you will have in the mid Holocene compared to the early Holocene, which means you will have weaker southwesterlies in the early Holocene, which is our main uh, hypothesis, like that there, are, there is a weaker southwesterlies in that period. And this actually shows the pattern in, in, in temperature, the, if you want the predicted pattern anomalies, again, mid Holocene minus early Holocene anomalies. And it shows if you want special coherency, like how much you can extrapolate the type of pattern that you have in your data. So basically a similar pattern with an early Holocene optimum as we observed in this area, you will, the, this model will predict that you will find it here and you will find the, the opposite pattern in the red shaded area. And actually all the little crosses and names are other proxy data based on completely different approaches that are compatible with this type of conclusion, for instance. Since this is red compared to our blue, in this area you would expect a mid Holocene uh, climatic optimum, and that's exactly what happens at these uh, two Megan Dufresne cores. And I think this is my summary. So basically, we set out to, to reconstruct the special extent of early Holocene uh, warmth, if you want, in a, in a transect east and south of New Zealand. And we found that the most, the strongest signal. Uh, for, with warmer than present sea surface temperature was observed south of the subtropical front during the early Holocene. And our interpretation is that this, this means that, the same, and this type of evidence based on temperature reconstructions it is also compatible with water mass indicator approach and basically suggests that there is a reduced subantarctic inflow into the bounty throw, which is itself driven by a less vigorous ACC or westerlies. That's all. Thank you. I've just got a question about the <clears throat> picked analysis at the end. Is, is that for a, a sort of annual average state or is that a particular season or have you looked at the two different season or the winter, summer? No, for, for, an, for an annual averages. In that case. Ever, annual averages. Sorry, I can't hear you. Annual averages. Their averages. So, is, is there a seasonal output at all, or, or not, from the picked? Because you'd imagine there's quite a lot large, although there certainly is a large seasonal difference, and I wonder what the value of the average state yeah. is in this context. Yeah. But frankly, I, I wouldn't know. But for instance, for for the proxy data, when we have proxy data across all these big uh, latitudinal transects, actually, it's usually a good idea to reconstruct annual. Average, so we try to to compare with similar type of thing. But the approach is actually it was developed by Andrew Laurie at NIWA and based on the Kitson uh, maps. So probably you could inquire okay. from those guys. Yeah, thank Thanks. you. Okay, so I want to talk to you today about how we can start to understand the different mechanisms that might be driving changes in the carbonate chemistry in the deep South Pacific over the last deglaciation by combining different proxies which uh, reflect some aspect of the carbonate system. So the motivation for doing this, as for a lot of the studies that we do, is to look at those uh, processes that are driving these large-scale glacial, interglacial changes in atmospheric CO2. And in particular, I'm gonna be focusing in on the last deglaciation. Now, there have been a number of different hypotheses that have been put forward, which invoke the role of the ocean in driving these changes in atmospheric CO2. So for example, changes in the stratification of the South Southern Ocean, which will change the amount of carbon that's being trapped within the deep ocean. Or for example, changes in the biological, pu biological pump, which will change the amount of carbon that's being advected into the deep ocean. But one of the problems that we often fall into as paleoceanographers is that we 
almost tend to take our favorite mechanism relatively arbitrarily and use that to explain the changes that we're seeing in our various different proxies. And what I want to suggest in this talk is that perhaps we can maybe do one better than this and use our proxies in a semi-quantitative way to try to assess the different mechanisms that might be driving the changes in the carbonate chemistry that we're seeing over these deglacial timescales. And to illustrate this principle, I'm going to show you um, a record from the deep, from the deep uh, South Pacific, this site, Pier 7556 from the eastern East Pacific rise. Now this site is located at three and a half thousand meters water depth. Um, and what I'm gonna show you are records of uh, benthic boron isotopes and uh, ventilation ages from this site. And then show you that by cross plotting these different records, we can start to look at the processes that are driving these changes in the carbonate chemistry on these glacial interglacial timescales. And in particular, what I'm gonna show you is that for this site, the glacial ocean seems to be, or the carbonate chemistry in the glacial ocean seems to be responding to a much more sluggish circulation, but also, and rather surprisingly, we seem to see evidence for potentially a weaker biological pump. And so, just to dive straight into the data, this is the boron benthic boron isotope record measured on PS7556, um, and we measured this on Sibicidoides mundulus. And what you can immediately see is that over the deglaciation, we have this strong increase in the delta 11b of, uh, of the carbonate. And this essentially tells us that pH is increasing across the deglaciation. And then we can use, if we assume that the delta 11b of the carbonate is reflecting that of borate in seawater, then we can use the well-known relationship between the delta 11b of borate and pH to determine changes in pH. And what we find is that over the course of the last deglaciation, there was this increase in the pH of about 0.3 pH units. Now, this is rather surprising in itself, um, considering the site's location, because we know from carbonate ion uh, reconstructions from the glacial that the deep Pacific had very little change in terms of carbonate ion. Now, carbonate iron and pH co-vary in the ocean, so we'd expect, based on this, that we'd see very little change in terms of uh, the pH in the ocean. Now, I would point out that a lot of these records have been generated um, in the East Pacific, so maybe, what, uh, sorry, in the West Pacific, so maybe what we're looking at is some sort of East-West difference. But the other kind of exciting thing about this record is that these large-scale increases in benthic pH relate to large increases in atmospheric CO2. So potentially what we're looking at with this record is degassing of the deep South Pacific. So I'm going to come back to that record in a bit, but now I just want to show you the, um, how we went about reconstructing the ventilation ages of um, this, the deep water at this site. And what we did was to measure paired benthic planktic radiocarbon dates and we took 15 radiocarbon dates across the deglaciation and then we used the planktic radiocarbon dates and corrected them for a surface reservoir effect. Now I would point out that at this site there are very little constraints on the surface reservoir effect and so we, what we've done here is to use uh, Giuseppe Siani's um, surface reservoir estimates from the Chile margin. So I want to emphasize that there is a lot of wiggle room within these records. But taking those surface reservoir ages, we've taken those planktic, the surface reservoir corrected planktic radiocarbon dates and generated the most probabilistic age depth model for this site and then used those calendar ages to look at the relative depletion of radiocarbon in the deep ocean relative to the contemporaneous atmosphere. And that's what's shown here on the right hand side. So this is the fraction of modern of the benthic relative to the contemporaneous atmosphere. And just to kind of give you a scale, this is the benthic atmospheric ages, which is a slightly nonlinear scale. But anyway, so what we're seeing is that across the deglaciation, we're seeing a decrease in the benthic atmospheric ages, going from ages of about 3,000 years to about 1,500 years. So taking all of these records together, we can then start to 
use these records, which each tell us, um, which each reflect um, some aspect of the carbonate system, and use them to try to understand the different mechanisms that are driving those changes in the deep Pacific carbonate chemistry. And the easiest way to conceptualize this is by cross-plotting these records. And um, then by cr what we can then do is to look at different mechanisms and say, uh, and to look at how those different processes affect these, our different proxies and then look or model different tra trajectories for uh, these mechanisms. So for example, if we add respired organic carbon to our deep ocean pool, we know that we're adding uh, CO2 to our deep ocean, so we'd expect the pH to decrease, but we're also adding isotopically light carbon, so also the delta C13 would decrease. So we'd move along a trajectory like this. And we can do a similar sort of uh, very basic box modeling for other processes such as changes in air-sea gas exchange, which is shown by this gray line, and also for changes in carbonate dissolution. And then we can compare these different model trajectories to our data. And so now this is the data going from the last glacial maximum in blue through to the modern in red. And what's immediately apparent is that the main glacial interglacial change seems to be driven by changes in the amount of respired organic carbon that's stored within the deep ocean. And there are a couple of different hypotheses for what sort of mechanism might be driving those changes in respired organic carbon. One might invoke changes in circulation, so if we have a, a more stratified glacial ocean, then potentially we can store more respired carbon within the deep glacial ocean. A second mechanism might be uh, by changing the strength of the biological pump. So if we have a greater export of organic carbon into the deep ocean, then we can store, potentially store more uh, respired organic carbon within our deep ocean site. And the way to pick apart these two different hypotheses might be to then go and look at the radiocarbon data. And we can do a similar sort of modeling exercise for our radiocarbon data. So now what's shown here is the radiocarbon again shown as a relative depletion compared to the contemporaneous atmosphere against the delta C13. And this gray mass here shows you the modern radio, radiocarbon and delta C13 data from uh, water masses taken from water masses between 2,500 meters and 4,000 meters water depth. And essentially what this is showing is, you, showing is the effect of aging. So as a water mass gets older, it's acquiring more respired organic carbon, and so you're moving in this trajectory here. And so um, what we'd expect then is that if our glacial data was responding only to changes in the amount of, um, it was responding only to changes in stratification, then our glacial data, might, we might expect it to plot along this regression line here. And now if we look at the data, what we're actually seeing is that Although the glacial data does seem to plot to the left-hand side of this mass, suggesting then that we might be looking at lower uh, rates of circulation, it also plots slightly below that line here. And so the only way that I can see that we can change or we can deviate from this kind of aging line is by changing the rates of remineralization. So as a water mass is traveling along its flow path, it's acquiring uh, isotopically light carbon. But if we, if we add less organic carbon or less isotopically light organic carbon to that, then the delta C13 won't, will, won't become as light. And so for a water mass of a given age, its delta C13 is not as, as light. Now, the idea of uh, lower rates of remineralization doesn't really fit with what we understand about the glacial ocean. We know that um, through, there was elevated dust fluxes, and so surface ocean productivity was generally higher. And we also see that in terms of the rates of, um, or the total organic carbon mass accumulation rates were typically higher as well in the glacial ocean. So it doesn't seem to point to an idea that nutrients were being trapped within the deep ocean. But what I suggest is that uh, we, the rates of remineralization could have been lower if our ocean was a lot colder. So during the glacial ocean, if you have a colder ocean, the rates of remineralization were lower. So even if you have higher surface ocean productivity, that organic carbon that's being rained out from the surface ocean isn't being remineralized, and that goes straight into the sediment. And so that can explain your higher rates 
of uh, organic carbon accumulation rates. So just to quickly summarize where we're at, I think uh, what we've tried to do here is to use our different proxies that reflect some aspect of the carbonate system to tell us something about the processes that are driving changes in the carbonate chemistry over these glacial interglacial timescales. And what we find is that the main change um, uh, the main glacial interglacial change at this site seems to be driven by changes in the amount of respired organic carbon that's being stored within the deep ocean. And this is either due to changes in the rates of circulation or changes in the amounts of ex uh, the export of organic carbon into the deep ocean. And then we use radiocarbon to try to pick apart these two different hypotheses. And what we find is that um, the glacial, whilst there was a reduction in circulation, there also seems to have been this um, lower rates of remineralization. And so what we'd like to do now is to try to um, do similar exercises with other sites from the Southern Ocean to see if we can reproduce uh, similar data. And that's it. Thank you. <laughs> For your presentation, you, are, you have been focusing on the LGM and trying to um, understand what the data is that's throwing the mechanism during that time. I'm just wondering that, um, is it also in your plan? Because some of the data seems to indicate some sort of evolution of the uh, three different proxies from LGM to Holocene. It seems like there's a trend. Um, maybe it's, it needs to be plotted in any other, fo in other forms to sort of portray um, the evolution of the, so basically yeah. my question is that, um, are you going to also look at deglacial evolution of the three proxies um, to investigate, you know, the detailed mechanism um, during that time? Yeah, so that is definitely the plan. Um, and I would have liked to talk about it in this talk, but I don't really have a very convincing answer for the actual processes that are driving the deglacial trend. So you can see that, um, going from the last glacial maximum through to the early deglaciation, we're sort of, we're, we're moving, so we're getting higher pHs, but there's very little change, or maybe there's even a decrease in the delta C13. And to explain that, I mean, based on my very naughty box model, the only thing that could drive that is changes in carbonate dissolution, which is not really what you'd expect as you're going out of a deglaciation, uh, as you're going out of a glaciation. So, um, yeah, we're still working on a story to explain this data, but yeah. <laughs> uh, oh, wow. uh, nice job, Jenny. Um, I was just wondering, in that interesting plot you show on the right-hand side there, um, if you thought about the error on your vector of reduced circulation and also on the slope of the data, um, because it seems that you're not a million miles away from some extensions of uh, of, of, of that kind of array, um, or you might be able to shift that line um, up and down somewhat. Yeah, no, that's true. So I guess one of the big problems is that we don't have very good constraints on the surface reservoir age. So our, actually, the error bars on our radiocarbon dates are pretty, pretty low. And I would show you, um, I think I've included this here. So what I, yeah, so this is, uh, no, this is not the right one. This is Luke Skinner's data from MD07-3076 uh, from the Central South Atlantic, and they've got much better constraints on um, the surface reservoir ages, and there, their glacial data falls bang on this uh, reduced circulation line. So, yeah, I don't want to. I, I don't want to get too carried away with the fact that we might have a re reduced respiration rates because yeah there are some there's some work to go all right last talk here we go we'll try and get through it quite quickly um so i'm going to stay in the ocean uh and i'm looking at deep sea corals so anyone who went to james ray's talk the other day will have seen records from some of these exact same corals um and i'll try and kind of go through a bit of coral stuff for those of you who aren't so familiar with them um, and this is, this is work I did during my PhD uh, at Bristol with Laura Robinson. I'm now at UCL, so email me there if you, if you need to. Um, so I'll give a very brief Southern Ocean background because most of you guys know that. Um, then I'll talk a little bit about barium. And there's probably a couple of people 
in the audience um, who know a bit more, so feel free to point out things at the end. Um, then I'll talk about Cobalt to Coral proxies, uh, and then I'll give you some, some records of the Drake Passage Southern Ocean. Um, so here's the Southern Ocean as we think about it. Jenny gave a nice introduction as to why we're interested in looking at the Southern Ocean changes um, over the uh, glacial, interglacial cycles in terms of CO2 in the atmosphere. Um, but what's kind of uh, missing at the moment is a kind of fully cross-sectional view of the Southern Ocean, and that's, that's one of the main things I'm trying to do with these corals, and you'll see how in a bit. Um, so to do that, I'm going to be reconstructing the barium concentration uh, in the Southern Ocean. Uh, and for those of you who aren't familiar with barium, uh, the main controls seem to be well, in the ocean at least, uh, in the surface ocean, it tends to absorb onto organic matter, and then um, you get barite crystals forming around decaying organic matter, uh, which sink through the ocean, so you get this um, productivity effect, reducing barium in the surface ocean, and as it sinks, it remineralizes, um, a bit like carbon, and then you get barium enrichment in the deep ocean. And it turns out that the Southern Ocean has quite strong gradients in barium, and it's a very good place um, to try and investigate changes in concentration. Um, so I'll just go back quickly just to point out some caveats. There's a whole bunch of um, sort of resuspension processes which may or may not affect the records we're seeing. So any questions about that at the end uh, you might have, I don't know. Um, so this is data from a cruise that Kim Pyle went on at Bristol, and she measured um, a bunch of barium in seawater. Now, just to give you a, an idea of what the barium uh, transect near to the Drake Passage looks like at the moment, and you can see um, that over here in the north, northern end of Drake Passage, uh, there's quite low barium. In the deep, there's quite high barium, and where that deep water is being upwelled by the Southern Ocean circulation, that high barium gets transported into the upper ocean. And then as that water moves north due to wind driven Ekman transport, um, some of that barium is presumably getting uh, sucked out of the surface ocean by the productivity. So that's what it looks like today. And you can see on this bottom figure, the density, the barium and the density figures look quite similar. So today, um, it, it may be that um, the dominant control on the distribution of this, this barium in the Southern Ocean is because of the vigorous circulation going on there. All right, so how are we gonna try and get at this barium signal? Um, so I used to study cold water corals, which as anyone else has studied them, uh, you'll know that getting any kind of proxy information that isn't radiocarbon or neodymium out of them is very, very difficult. Um, so what I ended up doing was uh, very, testing very simple sampling methods um, where you'd cut off a chunk measure a whole suite of trace elements and just to see if anything fell out. Um, and you'll see that it does in a minute. Um, so just uh, sampling sites very quickly. Uh, so here's the Drake Passage sampling sites in red. Um, actually, it's Birdwood Bank here and SARS Seamount here, which I've used for the calibration. But all of those sites have paleo corals, which I've used um, for the reconstructions. And then also for the calibration, we have these sites from the tropical Atlantic. Um, and they have co-located, all, all these sites pretty much have co-located seawater barium measurements, which is really, really useful. Um, these guys were dredged or trawled, um, so we have a fairly good idea where they came from, um, and these guys were collected by ROV, so we know exactly where they came from. So that's all very good for calibration purposes. Um, just a quick uh, view of the water properties at the sites, so red and purple are the Southern Ocean sites, look at the uh, panel C over there. Um, you can see Southern Ocean, more barium than in the Atlantic. And all the Atlantic sites kind of all together. Uh, it's kind of interesting, but uh, not a part of this talk. But Southern Ocean has much more. So we have a quite a good range of barium for our, our calibrations. Here is the calibration. Uh, anyone who's seen any other calibrations uh, might note that it's a bit different. So this actually has an intercept about four, which is hard to explain if uh, it's a simple relationship between uh, barium and seawater and 
coral incorporation. Obviously, corals probably wouldn't incorporate much barium if there was none in seawater, so there may be something going, different going on compared to other calibrations, but again, if anyone's interested, questions at the end. But you can see our sample set, uh, lots of different species, two different locations, um, and they, they fit a fairly good line. Um, so I'm, I'm just gonna go ahead now uh, and assume that line is right and do some reconstruction work. Um, so this is where the reconstruction corals are gonna be coming from. So this is a cross section through the sites in the Drake Passage. And you can see we have a quite a good distribution of corals up and down these various seamounts in the Southern Ocean. Um, and what you do is if you date enough, and we've dated many hundreds of these, these coral samples now, uh, you can start to get enough samples back through time to allow you to first get good records at each site, um, but also to maybe try and start to reconstruct some cross sections, which is really one of my aims. So here's some records. So this top panel, if I just go back, is the corals on, on Birdwood Bank on the north side of Drake Passage. And you can see what, what you'd expect, which is nice in the Holocene, where the shallower sites in red have substantially less barium than the deeper sites in blue. And that, that pattern seems to hold back through the Holocene, and that gives us, give me anyway, some confidence that our barium proxy is working back through time. A um, couple of interesting features in that record. Uh, when you come out of the Younger Gyas into the Holocene, the records appear to collapse onto one another a bit more. So may be related to some, some mixing, and I'll talk a bit more about that in a minute. And then you see this, this huge peak during the ACR, um, which is actually in the same corals that Andrea Burke has got some new radiocarbon data from, um, showing a, a strong, uh, so this is actually the shallowest northern site in the Drake Passage. And the radiocarbon shows that these guys, the water uh, bathing these guys got much older at this time. And they also had much higher barium, so there's, there's a little story to, to tell there. Um, and then these are the more southerly sites, um, all have quite high barium in the modern day, so there's not much structure um, in the Holocene. Um, and the structure, maybe, that you can see here is a little bit difficult to interpret um, without taking a sort of wider view. Um, so I'll do that now. Um, so in the top, you can see the barium records. This time, red is the most northerly, shallowest sites, and Deep blue is the most southerly, deepest sites, if you like. So going down across those southern ocean isopycnals. And what you can see is, again, shallow, uh, low barium, deep high barium, which is great. Um, and then as you get back into this deglacial period, you can see the gradients are, appear to be much, much bigger, um, which is very interesting. Uh, and this is, is correlated with some records which most of you guys probably know um, of um, maybe enhanced productivity in some areas of the Southern Ocean, uh, CO2 outgassing. It's also correlated with a peak in, in corals at the southern sites. So um, I'll go into that in a minute. And it's correlated with this, this radiocarbon uh, record of a ventilation event and CO2 outgassing down here. So how am I gonna reconstruct these cross sections? Um, basically, I'm doing a section right the way across the Drake Passage and using the modern, uh, modern rough uh, position of the polar front to extrapolate these guys. Um, and actually, if you were to tilt the polar front in different ways, it wouldn't really impact some of what I'm gonna say. So here are the cross sections. So hopefully you can immediately see, so up here you've got modern and early Holocene, um, and down here you've got the deglacial, and hopefully you can see they're totally different. Um, so it looks like the, the early Holocene, similar to the modern, uh, so maybe there's been a similar circulation or productivity state in the Southern Ocean during the Holocene. Um, and relatively flat uh, isolines of barium concentration uh, as I showed before, similar to today's density uh, isopycnals. But if you look back in a deglacial, much, much steeper, um, and it's physically unrealistic that your isopycnals are gonna tilt by that much because they just collapse back down 
uh, via eddy diffusion. Um, so the, the story I'm gonna tell you now, uh, what I think currently is going on, is that during this ventilation event here, when you're getting carbon release to the atmosphere, um, and that's from our radiocarbon records, um, that, that ventilation event, that upwelling, somehow is stimulating lots and lots of productivity uh, in this, in, in, well, in the Southern Ocean, in the Drake Passage here, but extrapolating a little bit to the Southern Ocean. Um, so you can see that productivity, maybe there is a, a value there. So the circles, I should say, uh, darker colors, high barium, lighter colors, low barium. Um, so there's a very light circle there, very, very low barium uh, in, the, in the shallower Drake Passage northerly sites. Um, yeah, again, sorry, I should say, uh, to our right is north and to our left is south. So very, very low. So that maybe that productivity is stripping the barium out, getting remineralized here, um, and adding barium into the deep, um, contributing to this strong gradient. Um, what's interesting is as, so between this one, F, and this one, E, in the early Antarctic cold reversal, there's not that much change, but we think there was a big ventilation event here. So what's actually going on with the ocean? And this is why I think this cross-section approach is kind of useful, because it shows you something about the ocean structure across these time intervals. So what could be going on? Well, maybe you could, you, you're not doing much actual ocean mixing at this time. You could be, for example, just increasing the overturning circulation without uh, mixing across um, isopycnals much. Um, what you do see is the, the barium in the shallow sites does increase a bit after the ventilation, so maybe that's, you've brought up some more barium to the surface. None of this is very controversial in terms of what we currently think about ventilation in the Southern Ocean. Um, if I just step back quickly to this big peak here, uh, Andre and I are uh, umming and ahhing about what this actually means, um, but you actually see you lose most of the corals in the Southern Ocean. So there's a couple of ways that we might explain this. One is that you have a huge increase in productivity which starves the deep erosion of oxygen, and maybe then that um, oxygen limitation on the sediments allows barium resuspension, so you get this big barium peak. Alternatively, you get a collapse in productivity, uh, basically, basically meaning all that water you're upwelling with high barium, the barium doesn't get doesn't get stripped out anymore. Um, so you're just left with high barium in the shallow ocean. So a couple of ideas we're, we're playing with at the moment. So where you, interestingly, where you see the change to modern conditions um, is right across the Younger Dryas Holocene transition. And why that is, uh, we're, we're currently thinking about ideas. Um, but, um, so I'll skip this one. Um, so this, is, this goes back to um, the, what James called the, something like the salty bottom water oscillator or something. Um, and the idea is that at some stage during the deglaciation, you shoal this um, boundary between an upper circulation cell and a deeper circulation cell. Actually, you don't shoal it, you deepen it during the deglaciation and that allows more vigorous mixing um, of the, of the deeper ocean, and could that be why this is now more homogeneous than it is in here when it's very highly stratified in terms of barium? So hopefully I've given you some, some idea about why corals can be really cool if you have loads of them and you can date loads of them, get ocean cross sections, um, and maybe some, some interesting ideas about the deglacian, de deglaciation and carbon dioxide. Thanks. Nice talk, nice, potentially nice story too. Um, so as you show in the schematic and on the last slide as well, it seems that barium concentration reflects mixed signal of ventilation, mixing, productivity, and potentially other stuff as well. Um, I'm not familiar with the isotope system of barium, but do you think, is there any previous study or existing literature that suggests that potentially there's some isotope fractionation of barium that can potentially constrain 
between the different mechanisms and you know, potentially help to um, constrain your further interpretations as well. So I don't know exactly, but I'm sure I'll be talking to Tristan, who's just up there, a bit more about barium isotopes uh, in the future. Yeah.